Hello, my name is Thomas Gastler, and I'm very happy to be part of this event. On the way to a sustainable bioeconomy, we are facing two main challenges. These challenges are also contributing greatly to the main responsibilities of our generations, which are also reflected within the so-called sustainability development goals defined by the United Nations. The first challenge that we face is the growing world population and its industrial needs. Calculations are somehow dependent on varying assumptions and constraints, but the community is quite certain that we will see a sharp increase until 2050 and that we might even crack the 10 billion barrier by then. The second challenge that we have to face is the uh, climate crisis. When we look back for approximately one and a half centuries, we see that the annual temperature increase compared to the average value from the 20th century is constantly rising. If we further correlate the temperature increase with the annual increase of carbon dioxide levels, we see that these two phenomena are interconnected. One does not really need a sophisticated mathematical model now to see in which direction the temperature curve will develop if the carbon dioxide levels are increasing. But why is that? Natural and seasonal changes in the levels of carbon dioxide are normal and occur throughout the year. Each year we see an increase in carbon dioxide levels during autumn and winter, which will decline again um, when photosynthesis is increasing during spring and summer. The atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are normally held constant by a very fine interplay of biological processes on the land, but also in the oceans. And as I said before, seasonal changes occur and are normal, but as also shown before, a pronounced upwards trend, especially during the last 100 years, is clearly visible. We know now that this sharp increase is primarily due to the anthropogenic release of carbon dioxide. I'm aware that I now oversimplify a complex interplay, but in fact, it is, it is that simple. The carbon dioxide levels are rising because we keep burning fossil fuels. One way out of that dilemma on the midterm would be to use carbon dioxide by industry. Several of the so-called carbon capture technologies are now on the rise. However, their real life applications in large, large scale that make an impact are still elusive, especially for the case of biotechnology. Almost all biotech processes today rely on the use of so-called organic substrates, which are typically derived from plant material by photosynthesis. Photosynthesis therapy happens at very low efficiency, which is also the reason why biodiversity is threatened if you really want to scale such a technology up. A more sustainable way is to use abundant resources such as sunlight and carbon dioxide. We nowadays can turn CO2 in, and sunlight with high efficiency into what we call mediator molecules, such as methanol or formate. These mediators can then be used as substrate, uh, substrates directly or as energy substrates for further microbial carbon dioxide fixation. This route is exactly what we have focused on in our work, which was using genetic engineering to, have, to change the metabolism of yeast in a way that it can now use carbon dioxide as a carbon source uh, for biomass fueled by the oxidation of methanol. To achieve this aim, we started with native methanol assimilation in yeast, which has high similarity to the carbon dioxide fixation um, in, in plants and in other autotrophic organisms. In this pathway, methanol is carbon and energy source. In the first step, we generated a cell that can only use methanol as energy source by oxidation down to CO2 and NADH. The assimilation of methanol via the um, native pathway is now completely blocked in this strain. In the following, we step-by-step step integrated a Kelvin cycle into that cell. This resulted in the creation of a Kelvin cycle, which is likewise compartmentalized as its native counterpart. But instead of being localized to the uh, chloroplast, we have now a pathway localized to the yeast peroxisome. But can it grow? This was the crucial question at that time in the lab. And astonishingly, yes, uh, these strains were able to grow exponentially right away under conditions where only carbon dioxide incorporation can lead to biomass formation. 
Further verification showed us that the newly obtained lifestyle is indeed autotrophic. We further used a method called adaptive laboratory evolution that relies on natural selection and evolution. Clearly one of the most powerful methods that we have in synthetic biology, but also not as uh, 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 known as the famous CRISPR-Cas9 system. Using this ale method, we increased the growth rates in several isolates after a few months of cultivation, and the best performing uh, clone grew with more than two times faster growth rates than its originator. This clearly showed that the boundaries of the synthetic autotrophic system have not been fully explored so far. With our system, technologies can now be developed that allow the screening for faster carbon dioxide fixating enzymes. This could in turn lead to increased crop, um, crop plant yields and reduce the native, uh, negative environmental impact of industrial agriculture and could further help to protect biodiversity. Another application is the development of a production process for yeast biomass that is then used as a protein source in animal feed. This might lead to a more sustainable protein production by using carbon dioxide as a carbon source and could also be integrated into the concept of song, uh, circular and sustainable communities of the future. Today, I showed you how we introduced a dramatic shift in the diet of the yeast Piche pastoris from a hetero into an autotroph. I'm aware that we still have a very long road ahead of us, but I'm also very convinced that this finding together with the work of others can contribute to the functional bioeconomy of tomorrow. Thank you very much.